It's my pleasure to invite you to participate in the fourth Exmid Professional Fairs workshop. For the first time, this workshop will take place completely online over four days, from the 23rd until the 26th of November 2020. The workshop is distributed across these three, four days so as to enable participants to continue their regular work as well. yesterday can you see the presentation yes okay let's go ahead well as Bruno said my main uh, interest on in, uh, during my day-to-day -day work is working on antimicrobial stewardship and understanding how people make decisions is one very important part if we want to improve antimicrobial use. So uh, trying to apply what I've learned uh, in the field of antimicrobial stewardship to COVID-19 will be, is the purpose of this, of this presentation. And I would like to start with this uh, poll and I would like to know what do you think about how did you prescribe during the first uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So please go ahead. William, can we go ahead? Okay, as we can see here, 50% of our audience thinks that uh, they uh, were uh, somewhat rational, but there is still quite a room for improvement in which uh, regarding uh, therapeutic decisions. So we, we go ahead. Okay, um, I've divided my presentation in, in four parts. The first thing is just to uh, to set the framework that uh, uh, prescribing is making decisions. Second, I would like you to understand how we make decisions. Third, uh, how pandemic has altered this equilibrium that we usually have when making therapeutic decisions. And finally, some quick uh, hints on can, how can we limit the irrationality of, uh, of prescribing decisions. And uh, as I said before, uh, uh, Prescribing uh, is a process of uh, decision making that starts with a clinical problem that uh, has to get a solution, and that some, sometimes it's prescribing a drug, and sometimes it's better not to prescribe a drug. And uh, but with between the clinical problem and the final decision between the input and the output, there is um, is a process, and uh, we gotta know that process because it's uh, it's relevant if we want to improve it. And I would like to go deeply in this process. And um, I think that uh, we, we, we've learned a lot about decision-making from two uh, very different disciplines, uh, very different disciplines to us, to ours. Uh, this is economics and psychology, that both working together have founded a kind of um, area, academic area, which is called behavioral economics, that has been awarded uh, with several Nobel Prizes in the last years. These perhaps are the, father, the founder fathers of the behavioral economics, Sversky and Kahneman. 
And if we, if we open the hood of the car and we look inside, we see that this decision making, I mean, between the input and the output, there are two main areas where we have to decide. The first one is to try to know what's going on. We have to interpret reality, that's diagnosis. And once we know what's going on, or we, we think what, what we think what's going on, then we have to assemble that with our knowledge and our, v, and our values. We know to uh, apply the solution. So these are the main two parts of the decision process. But it's not so easy because there are many decisions all, so, uh, so diagnostic and also therapeutic at the same time, it's not so easy. The process is very much uh, more complex than we see in, in reality. And uh, this is because uh, the main mechanism that we have to make decisions is not conscious. It's what uh, behavioral economics call is the type one system. It's an intuitive system that uh, uh, has helped us as a species, as a human being to survive. When uh, if, we, if we listen the roar of a lion in the jungle, we do not think which degrees it's coming from, at what speed is coming the lion. We don't have to spend all that time and all that energy in knowing all those things. We react very immediately. That's the type one system. And that system is responsible for the most part of our decisions, even though we don't know that system is there. The reflective part, the type two system, uh, the conscious part is quite more, uh, is responsible for a less proportion of our decisions. Our conscious decisions are a tiny part of the whole part of the total uh, decisions. And that's that because the, the, the conscious part of the decisions is very costly. I mean, it's very tiring and we could not afford to make all those decisions costly. Uh, uh, consciously. And I want to go deeper in the type one intuitive system. It's automatic, it's fast, but it's emotional. And as I said, it's unconscious. And there are five principles of this system that affects us in everything we do. Uh, first, uh, this system to work efficiently, as it works efficiently, uh, it needs to, pl to play or to, to be ruled by, uh, or to be ruled by some uh, uh, rules of thumb that it's called heuristics and those rules affect both diagnostic and therapeutic decisions for example if we think of therapeutic decisions humans in general unconsciously we are very uh, we are uh, we, we suffer loss aversion it's, it's for us it's uh, losses counts a lot more than potential benefits when we make a decision and also one of these principles is the decision inertia I mean, if you don't, uh, no change is the, the best option. And um, I mean, these, these principles, they embed all what we are doing. And as these principles make this very efficient, uh, they are also prone to errors. And we have to know that. Uh, uh, the way we think is prone to certain errors that are systematic errors, they're called cognitive bias. This cognitive bias can be, uh, overcome by expertise. The more we know, uh, how, the more experienced we are, our fast thinking is more accurate. Um, the other problem with this type one system is that we are making decisions with not complete information, okay? Those are mainly the four ingredients of our type one intuitive system that is responsible for most part of our decisions. And uh, thinking that, uh, knowing that uh, uh, these are the main ingredients of our, uh, of our thinking, uh, I would like to ask you, which do you think are the main, uh, the main, components than during a pandemic can influence negatively our decision making. And I would like to point you these five. I would like to point you the emotions that we face during a pandemic, the expertise or lack of expertise, the uncertainty or the scarcity of resources. And I would like to know what you think about this. Please go ahead with the poll.
William, can we go ahead with the results? Okay, that's good, that's good. You think that the uncertainty that we face when we are in front of a patient during a pandemic is the factor that affects more our decisions. Okay, I think that's good and it's good also for the second talk. And I agree with you. Uh, I mean, uncertainty is stressing. Uh, and it's very interesting what psychologists can teach us with their experiments. They say that the stress of uncertain pain is bigger, uh, is larger than the stress of certain pain. They, they, they prove this with a very smart experiment. It's a randomized clinical trial. They randomized uh, their uh, subjects to uh, two arms. One arm in which they had the 50% chance of receiving X and, and X discharge electroshock same intensity, and in the other arm, 100% of receiving the same amount of volts electroshock. And the stress was significantly higher in those who didn't know if they were going to receive the electroshock or not. So the uncertainty hurts, and that makes things difficult. This is not nothing that we don't know. Dr. Osler said in the 19th century that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. Uncertainty, we have to live with that. But the problem is that in the pandemic, uh, the uncertainty arises very, very much. We don't, we have uncertain epidemiology and unknown self-risk. We don't know what's the natural history of the disease we're facing, and we don't know enough of how to treat. So if we want to, in, to, to improve uh, therapeutic decisions, we have to decrease uncertainty. We need new knowledge, better evidence, and less uncertainty. This is what Jesus will tell us later. Us what can we use uh, to uh, decrease uncertainty? In the second place, the second ingredient that uh, it affects us more in a pandemic is the expertise. Uh, as I said, expertise increases the reliability of the intuitive system, that system that is responsible for most decisions. The problem is that expertise does not, abound, does not abound during pandemics. And why not? Because very few healthcare workers have gone through a pandemic. And going through a pandemic is something absolutely new, um, different mindset, and um, something we've not been trained for, even if we are very good clinicians. And second, this is a new disease for all. So what expertise we can have in a new disease for all? It's very difficult to have the expertise. So increase uncertainty, less expertise when making decisions. Three, emotions. And I think we should not underestimate this component because um, when it comes to interpret the world around us, we need to realize that our feelings can trump our expertise. And if the expertise is slow, this is even worse. Uh, it's very difficult to master our emotions when analyzing the world. Uh, and it's very difficult. Uh, we, we don't have to be uh, emotionless processes. I'm not saying that, but we have to be aware of our emotions and take them into account. During COVID-19 pandemics, um, there has been a lot of emotional prescribing, uh, driving. Oh, uh, prescribing, I don't know how to say that. Uh, prescribing has been dried by very strong emotion. We as physicians in charge of patients have felt impelled to do more or to do more than we knew that we could do. That's, that could have pushed over treatment. And outside us, everybody else felt impelled to help in the crisis. Everybody thought that they understood how to know how to cure. COVID-19, those WhatsApp groups, those uh, think this is spread of misinformation. And um, I mean, this has in influenced negatively also our prescribing decisions. Four, in this setting, there has been a specific cognitive bias when making decisions. And uh, these systematic errors have been uh, prejudicial for uh, our decisions. And the main or more specific cognitive bias during pandemic, and the best way to avoid it is to be systematical and to be aware of it is wishful thinking, is to let our reasoning, our reasoning to be swayed by, by our emotions, by our beliefs. I mean, and um, 
and this is important. And the mechanism underneath this wishful thinking is the motivated reasoning, is uh, to think uh, we are thinking with the aim uh, of reaching a kind of conclusion. If I'm a virologist, I think that the best therapy for COVID-19 will be an antiviral. And I will be against of anything that might impair the control of the virus. And everything I read, I will look with an extra critical lens on the side that thinks on the opposite to me. And we have to be aware of this. And finally, there is a last point, uh, is the scarcity. And this is very specific of pandemic. We lack many things during pandemic, something that has never happened to us before. We have a scarce time, a scarce money, a scarce resources, human and material, masks, doctors, and nurses. And usually when you face a scarcity, a scarce situation, you, you human beings adopt a specific mindset, uh, which is composed of both focused thinking and channeling view. Okay, and as this might have some benefit, it makes very efficient the short-term decisions, it also has some detrimental effects because we ignore the long term. And we also, when we tunnel, we have a tunnel vision, we focus very much on a problem, we, our reasoning, our conscious thinking works worse. This has been proven uh, when facing patient, uh, individuals who are focusing too much to solve easy problems. And finally, a scarcity, because of these reasons, leads to more scarcity, the cost of immediateness. And, and this affects our therapeutic decisions. And uh, the last part of my presentation was this. Okay, we know that we fail when we make decisions. We tend to fail when we make decisions. That the circumstances in pandemic make failures we make us more prone to failures and the cost of those failures may be larger because of the scarcity, but what can we do? And uh, I recently read a uh, uh, very nice, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, specialized blog in, in economics and psychology, or what can we do during uh, the, to mitigate the impact of the uncertainty in pandemic, no? And they just give, uh, a solution, as they say, is practical wisdom is try to balance uh, your conflicting principles and uh, try to make it uh, aware of the problems. And they give four advice. First, start with data. We must know what we know, and that should be the starting point. We have to focus first on the areas of certainty. Second, we have to avoid the white and black thinking. That's very easy to go this way. Black and no, there are very few things that are really white and black, and we have to have our mind open. Third, it's very important to start with the rules, with the protocols. That's something we, we will see during the, the session. But then we have to be able to consider wise modifications. We have to personalize uh, our decisions. Okay, but you have to have a set, a starting point that is based on what we know. And we have to individualize avoiding the white and black thinking. And finally, we have to learn how to learn from uncertainty because we are not going to be able to skip uncertainty totally. So perhaps this would be my recipe to uh, try to improve our decisions. And, uh, so just to, to, uh, to end with my presentations, my, 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 my messages would be that we have to be aware that our day-to-day -day decisions are at risk uh, during pandemic, at higher risk than usual, that the main factors that are in influencing these mistakes or they're making them more mistake prone are the increase in certainty, the emotions we face, the lack of expertise in uh, this circumstance and the scarcity of resources. And the best way to approach uh, this, uh, this uh, environment that is prone to error is to be systematical and to adopt a um, positive mindset that includes these four parts. To start, we need to start with the facts, we need to avoid black and white thinking, 
we have to start from rules and then personalize, and then we have to learn to learn how to improve. And this is what uh, I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I don't know if there is a, any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Ramon, uh, for this uh, excellent uh, lecture. Very interesting. Uh, it seems that we have no question on the website. So uh, I don't know if uh, in France, uh, regarding uh, the treatment by hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin, we have a famous professor called uh, Professor Raoult. I don't know if you heard about him, but he tried to influence all the decisions and even physicians were like... Uh, uh, fo followers and uh, and uh, despite all the evidence uh, brought uh, during the last uh, months, they continue to support uh, 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 in a blinded way that he was true. What do you think about that? That I think that the best enemy, the best enemy, or the worst enemy, <laughs> depends on how you think, to the evidence is to uh, try to seed the doubt. And it's very easy to seed the doubt uh, in every argument. So I think that uh, that may be uh, some part of the hydroxychloroquine thing because uh, people, that's wishful thinking, very important part and motivated reasoning. The conclusion has been said. I think hydroxychloroquine has to work. And I justify, I go backwards to find the reasons why it should work. And I don't weigh in the same fashion the arguments pro and the arguments against. And I think that's a mind game, mainly. I mean, I don't know all the mechanisms that fuel that mind game in a specific persons. But I mean, that's a mind game. Jose Ramon, thank you. Okay. For your... can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Jose Ramon, thank you for your talk. Excellent. Uh, uh, there are two, uh, it's a question and a comment. I think there are two factors that in 2020 also uh, have a big effect on the decision making. One is peer pressure. Uh, everybody in your hospital is prescribing a university protocol. It's extremely difficult to be the outsider that, uh, you know, that doesn't prescribe hydroxychloroquine. And also authority, you know, it takes authority and media. You know, we live, uh, information uh, speed is such high that yes, it takes someone on TV or someone on social media to start to say that something works. That is very difficult to, you know, co counteract against those. So yeah, I think the times of this behavioral economies they were not in the times of social media and, and the speed of information that I think impacts a lot on decision making. I think you have to be fast. I mean, even for behavioral economics, because if the bad decision goes the mainstream, it's very difficult to get it out from the mainstream because it has occupied a need that you cannot occupy with any positive message. So I think that this mainstream in hospitals, the decisions, the collective decisions have to be worked early uh, and have to be transparent and have to be honest. That what we know, start with the facts, set the rules and avoid white and black thinking. So I think that uh, the best way to go against the out of the group mainstream, Raul, media, etc., is to make collective decisions in your group. Because you avoid uncertainty. You avoid the responsibility, not you avoid, you mitigate the personal responsibility of, this, of uncertain decisions. I think intensive care doctors do that very well. They do their daily report twice a day and they can share decisions. And I think shared decision is the best way to mitigate some, some is a good way to mitigate the impact of uh, therapeutic decisions. Jose, we have, we have three additional questions. Uh, the first one from Madeleine. 
Do you think different behavior in different countries has influenced the treatments used and tried in the European countries? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, the, the rate, the, the, the rate, the use of certain agents has not been the same in different countries, and it may depend on the leadership that has promoted that uh, therapies or the availability. For example, ivermectin in some countries. And I think there are, there are really several factors ha that have influenced our decisions. If we could find a good behavioral economics, uh, he would enjoy very much what has happened in our hospitals. To understand that. Second question. Have there been extreme, extremely dogmatic characters in uh, evidence-based medicine who have not considered in making decisions all the variants that they have mentioned such as certainty and the emotional system that motivates the decision that you would recommend. Okay, it's, I mean, that's the reason, that's the point of this presentation is that we know what influences our decisions. Even we like or we don't like, it doesn't matter. We have to know what makes people make decisions. And uh, I think that one thing that we have to avoid is being dogmatic. I have had to eat my words several times during this pandemic. And that, not, that doesn't taste very much when you don't expect to eat your words. So we all have to speak knowing that we may have to eat our words. And that's a good recipe to avoid dogmatism. Okay, one additional question. Is this the right time and opportunity to check and balance the type one clinical decision making in future pandemics by framing an objective method now? I think that we should approach this problem scientifically. And this might be while quite well off our discipline. And we might contact people that know better than us about the technicalities of decision making. I think that's an opportunity. And finally, the last question, what do you think about physicians that still think hydroxychloroquine works and continue to prescribe? I don't know many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So I give you your yeah, hand. Okay, the second presentation is going. Uh, it's going to go through or by uh, Dr. Jesus Rodriguez Baños, former president of our society, and he's a. Apart from that, he's a personal friend, friend, uh, friend of mine. And I think that one of the recipes, I mean, you, you all said that uncertainty was the main factor that negatively impacted your decisions. Now, he, he's going to tell us uh, um, what builds the evidence, the evidence that is the uh, instrument to decrease uh, uncertainty as much as possible. Jesus, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Jose Ram Bruno. It's a big pleasure to uh, try to speak with you about this, this issue. So this is the, the title that you propose. So it's a three uh, complex words. And let's see. So I have no conflict of interest for this talk. And we will try to review how was evidence building during the pandemic, how to try to generate evidence and what to do in the meantime. So uh, first of all, I would like to start with a question. So William, we will uh, make this poll. So did you prescribe any of this drug for COVID-19 patients during March, April? And the options are lopinavir, ritonavir, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, combination of the above, no, or I don't take, take care of COVID-19 patients. Please vote. Try to be honest. Okay, William, I think we can go with the results. All right, so uh, a good proportion of you uh, prescribed something and the most frequent was either hydroxychloroquine or a combination. Good, so I think that reflects uh, the reality that I've also seen. So let, let's start with some facts, what happened with some of these drugs. So lopinavir, ritonavir, when this, the epidemic started, there was some in vitro data suggesting that it might be 
uh, active in vitro against the virus. And there was some anecdotal data in, in the previous SARS uh, epidemic. Uh, in early March, this information made many hospitals to include this drug in their protocols. On 7th of May, there was the online publication of uh, the result of a randomized trial uh, on this drug versus the standard of care that provided negative results, but the study had to be stopped because of the control of the pandemic in China and the sample size for the study was lower than expected. And that caused some doubts about the results of the trial. And until we have no more relevant news about this drug until the 29th of June, in which the press release from recovery trial uh, uh, suggested that there was, they find no efficacy uh, uh, for this drug. What about hydroxychloroquine? Uh, again, uh, some studies provided some potential activities by in vitro data. On, on the 20th of March, the paper uh, signed by Gautret and colleagues, uh, uh, Raul being the senior author in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents, caused a big impact. It also includes the inclusion in many protocols in hospitals. In 14th of May, there was the online publication of the randomized trial uh, in mild or moderate cases in British Medical Journal, suggesting that there was no effectivity of this drug. On the 5th of June, we have the press release from Recovery uh, stating that they have found no efficacy. And in 15th of June, there was the preprint of that paper, uh, showing no efficacy and longer hospitalization time for this trial. But for the chloroquine, there was, as, as Jose was saying before, there was a very important aspect as well, which was the uh, support for this drug that some relevant persons in the world, like the President of the United States provided. It was the tweet, as you can see, in the 21st of March, uh, uh, supporting the use of, of this drug. And the impact of that was enormous. You can see here uh, the internet searches for purchasing chloroquine, for purchasing, not just for uh, uh, about the drug or about information, but just for purchasing the drug. You can see uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, millions of uh, uh, searches that were done uh, even in, in that day. Uh, uh, there was some uh, doubts about it, of course, and, and, and here there is a very important sentence in this uh, editorial, which is first, do not harm. So this is a principle that we uh, have to undertake whenever we are in doubt and when, whenever we are uh, taking decisions as we discussed before. So here you can see the, the, what, what I call the first landmark randomized control trial published uh, regarding uh, drugs to treat COVID-19. You can see here that Lopinavir, Ritonavir, we have the uh, peer review publication on May 7. For hydroxychloroquine, the, the first paper was in May 14. For remdesivir, uh, it was in, in the preprint was in April 22, and the publication in the 16th, it was in the negative one. Uh, the remdesivir one with some activity uh, was uh, press release in April 29, and the paper was out in May 22. And the dexamethasone uh, trial by the recovery team, in we, we have the press release in June 16. You can see that the results, uh, they were negative for repinavir and hydroxychloroquine are the first in the remdesivir. Some of them were uh, affected by low sample size or moder mild to moderate cases in the case of uh, hydroxychloroquine. We have the uh, limited efficacy of remdesivir in the New England Journal paper and the very important effect of dexamethasone with retinal mortality, but here you can see June 16. And if we uh, consider when this news came out, uh, what I would say news that were uh, supported by randomized control trials, and this is the uh, epidemic, the number of cases per day in Spain as a, uh, as a reference, you can see that when this, this information was coming out, and particularly when the, the dexamethasone trial came out, the whole issue, the whole uh, wave have already gone. So that means that we needed to take the decisions during the whole pandemic without having real uh, information about uh, the randomized control trials or the highest uh, uh, evidence-making uh, type of studies. And even these uh, results, the first of them were negative results, meaning that what we have been, some of us have been doing before was not working. 
if we put the mortality uh, curve in Spain, it's even more worrisome. So we have to see a lot of patients, thousands of patients dying before we have any evidence about how to treat them or what to do uh, for the best of their management. That means that we've been facing a really, really uh, challenging time, uh, as Jose explained, and so it, it perfectly explained uh, the difficulties in decision-making process. What has happened? So as you, as you very well uh, did in your pool, uh, there's been quite a variety of decisions. So here is the, the UK cohort, in where you can see that corticosteroid agents were uh, provided to, uh, uh, let's say, around 10 to 15% of the patients, uh, uh, some antiviral agents uh, to a smaller proportion, uh, etc. So, and, and the most frequently used drug here was antibiotic agent, antibacterial agent. That means that we were facing a huge uh, uncertainty situation in which uh, knowledge of the disease, management of the patient, severity of the patient were influencing our decisions. And then, uh, of course, we all agree that we need to have uh, good data up front. And then in a pandemic, we need to be very fast in trying to provide the best data possible. But uh, one of the key problems here is that precisely the pandemic affects or impacts the people who have to make the clinical research. So uh, this is an example of any hospital in, in many parts of the world during the first wave. Uh, how can we do good clinical research in this environment? How can we have informed consent with these patients? How can we uh, uh, you know, have all the collection, uh, appropriate collection of all the data, et cetera, et cetera. So the uh, problem here is that the pandemic is affecting also uh, the matter of the, the meat of, of how to do clinical research because as uh, Josera was saying, scarcity is a very important issue here. But I think that we have to learn of the, uh, uh, with the good experiences. And I think that recovery is something to learn from. So in the UK, they were able to put in practice a, a randomized trial with different uh, comparisons from the very beginning, including a good number of hospitals and working in a very pragmatic protocol that have provided some results. Of course, we can state that results came very late but this was the first results that uh, have a good number to indicate what to do with our patients. And I think that's a very important example to, to follow for the future. Uh, so we need randomized trials. Okay, so let me discuss with you one aspect. So we think that randomized trials are the way to get evidence. And let me explain, let, let me discuss with you this, this recent trial that was published in JAMA. So this is the effect on remdesivir versus standard of care uh, on clinical status at 11 days in patients with moderate COVID-19. So they compare standard of care, five days of remdesivir and 10 days of remdesivir. There were three arms in the study. I look at the conclusions. Those randomized to a 10-day curse of remdesivir did not have a statistically significant difference in clinical status compared to standard of care. Patients randomized to five day has a statistically significant difference in the status compared to standard of care, although the difference was some uncertain clinical value. So according to this trial, five days of remdesivir works better than 10 days of remdesivir. So how to explain that? How can we explain that in a rational way? So let me go for a pool again to see what you think about this. So how did you interpret this data? Uh, so William, please, can we go for the pool? Do you think that the design of the trial was not appropriate? Do you think that randomized trials are not perfect? Or uh, simply, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. Please vote what you think. Well, thank you very much. I think we can go with the results. Well, most of you think that the design was not appropriate. Some of you uh, think that randomized are not perfect, but a good proportion say that I don't, I can't explain this. Okay, so let's see what happens here, or I, I'm not going to go, uh, let's say through details in this in this specific trial, but, but I think that we need to be 
critic and be cautious when interpreting the data. Uh, I have been discussing with many colleagues that we are uh, we show a high criticism when we read observational studies, but the level of criticism with randomized trial is usually very low. So people see randomized trial, go to the conclusion, and that's it. That's perfect. That's the solution. I got it. And I want, would like to discuss with you that be, please be very careful. Uh, for example, in, in COVID-19, several of the trials that have been performed are what I call all comers are welcome, meaning that any patient with COVID-19 is included in the trial, okay? And that's fine at the very beginning when we don't know very much about the disease because uh, this is what we can do. But be, in this type of trials, you have to be very careful when you have a negative result if the included patients are not expected to respond. For example, uh, I, I don't know what will happen with tocilizumab, no idea. But if you read the Roche the paper or the, uh, trial, which is uh, now in preprint for tocilizumab, one third of the patient were on mechanical ventilation when tocilizumab was administered. So if your endpoint is mortality, that might be fine. But if you want to avoid uh, uh, that the patient goes to mechanical ventilation, then it's too late. And also one third of the patient didn't have data suggesting that they have hyperinflammation. And in those patients, you would not expect a drug that is supposed to treat that condition to have any effect. So be careful with that. And the other way around, if you have a positive result in your study, look carefully at the table one, look carefully which are the patients that are included in that trial and see if your patient, the patient that you're going to take a decision on was adequately represented at that trial because it might be very much underrepresented. There was a lot of discussion with dexamethasone with, for patients with, with mild disease. Should we treat them with dexamethasone or not? So I think that uh, more data came after that suggesting that in, in, in more patients could be effective, but you have to be careful about that. Second, please have a look at the endpoint. Some of the endpoints of the trials, we, we all agree that are not very appropriate to, to measure what happens in the disease. And third, if, if we're using an open design, which uh, in these uh, uh, very feasible trials, in these very pragmatic trials is a need because it's very complex to organize very rapidly a double blind trial. So most of them are, are open design. You have to be aware that patients may be uh, uh, retire from the study or stop in the trial just because the physicians think that this patient that has gone to the comparator arm or that has gone to a drug that you have doubts about whether it's cause of events, you stop it before the patient that are uh, 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 assigned to the other arm. So you have to be careful about that. Well, I, I don't have to say much about observation as we all know that limitations, we all know and, and particularly the big problems is that journals are not so uh, demanding for quality of observational trial, or many journals are not so demanding for quality, are not so detailed in, in reviewing the observational studies. So a lot of bad quality observational studies are accepted in many journals. So we have to be careful about confounding, about the mortal time bias, and about how uh, uh, patient in which treatments are changing over the course of the disease are managed in this trial. So we have to be very, very careful in observation. But please be also very careful about randomized trials and be very critical about them and how to apply the uh, drug result to your patients. And then how can we do to recruit patients in, in trials? So please, this is another question I have for you. Uh, did you recruit patients for a randomized trials in, in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic until now? So options are yes, more than 50% of my admissions, 25 to 50%, less than 25% or no, I could not for whatever the reason. Please vote. Okay, let's, let's see the results. Okay, so uh, more than 60% of uh, people listening to this webinar could not randomize patients to trials. And uh, the other proportion, yes, could, uh, could include a low proportion of patients. So this is the reality. The reality is that we'll be overwhelmed by, by our clinical work, and this has been really difficult. And trials are not open in all 
hospital. That means that many hospitals do not have the opportunity to include patients in trials. That means that for the next pandemic or for the present new wave of the pandemic or for the next few months, we need to be prepared and we need to try to do better. And we need to do that in different domains. Like for example, we need a multi-center structure to try to do this trial. So we need to be prepared how to do a design, how to uh, develop protocols, uh, CRS very rapidly. Uh, uh, and you cannot do that if you are not prepared to do that. So people, you, you need to have identify the persons who are able to do that, the teams who can coordinate that, and whenever uh, a new a emerging infection is starting, put them to work already uh, to start working on a protocol. That's absolutely crucial so that you, you can have that very, very fast. Of course, uh, one th good thing in this uh, pandemic is that we have had fast track for approvals. And of course, you need international and national institutional support. And we can do better here, particularly in Europe, where different trials have been mixing and in, in some countries uh, more than 50 uh, trials have been competing for patients in different hospitals. What can would you do in your hospital? Well, you have to start working on, on trying to implement the clinical research culture. So clinical research is part of our work and we, we need to implement that in our daily, the, the, the way that we work daily. It's not only to take a decision on the treatment of a patient, it's also how to do I collect the data so these data are useful to learn. Uh, of course, we need management people, we need data managers, we need research nurses. We need to have these people train and then maybe they're working on, on other diseases and other medical specialties. But if it's a pandemic camp, they, they should be uh, recruited to work in, in, this, in these trials. Of course, pharmacy, microbiology, biobanking, and uh, the clinical work organization, as I said. And the studies have to be very pragmatic, very similar to clinical practice, and all the uh, bureaucracy have to be reduced uh, as much as possible in order to facilitate uh, the daily work. So if we have uh, for appro approved drugs, for example, lopinavir, ritonavir, or hydroxychloroquine, these are drugs that we have avail uh, available. Uh, the way to try to go would be to uh, start with an initial design of a randomized trial in, in sites in which this, the, the trial is not possible, they, they are not participating in the trial, an observational study can be started with a very uh, a prepared collection of information that would uh, support uh, learning from that. And then both information from the observational and the initial uh, data from the randomized trial could help to adapt the design very early on. And that could be done very early if this information is done in a good way. Of course, for new drugs, we need standard regulatory based randomized trials, but both for approved and new drug, they can be included in uh, this idea of multi-dimensional adaptive platform trials. What is that? Well, uh, the classical approach is that we have to compare different uh, interventions, then measure the outcomes. Then we have to start a new trial with a different type of intervention. And then we have to start a new trial with a different type of intervention. That takes years to, to have information about that. So an adaptive platform is a platform in which different interventions can be compared at the same time. And by using a Bayesian uh, methodology, you can uh, have interim, repeated interim analysis. And with this uh, result comes out, you help in changing the randomization process, either by some of the arms can be deleted, some arms can be implemented, some criteria for inclusion of patients can be modified. Of course, this is complex from, from a methodological point of view, but this, in this way, uh, uh, we can provide information and modify the design of the trial in a way that really will provide adequate information. Uh, I, I suggest you to look at the remap cap uh, webpage where this is already working. There, there is a study in pneumonia working like that, that is also going to be implemented in patients with COVID-19. So my conclusions are that we need better preparedness for performing randomized trials in pandemics uh, from international to national levels, but also to site levels, to hospital levels. We have to be very careful with social media dissemination of fake news and low quality studies. During this uncertainty phase, we have to do our best to include as many as possible patients in well-designed studies. If you can participate in a randomized trial, that's a fantastic way to go. Then uh, uh, with this, situation, uh, uh, the uncertainty uh, is on the trial, it's not on your shoulders. 
And, and if you cannot participate in a trial, participate in a very well designed uh, data for uh, observational study to collect adequate data. Good observational studies are important, but most of them, unfortunately, are not that good. And we have to be aware of the huge limitation. But be aware that randomized trials also have limitations and we have to be read them carefully and be as critic as we are with observation. That's all. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. Thank you. Jose, Jose you are muted. Sorry. Thank you for this interesting presentation, this talk. Uh, Jesus, there is one question from the audience and I would like to ask you another one. Uh, the question from the audience is, what do you think of the strong statement from WHO about the use of esteroids at the beginning of the pandemic? If you can do any kind of uh, your opinion on that statement with the available evidence. And my question well, uh, would be... Okay. No, well, as you know, there was some meta-analysis performed for SARS based mostly on observational study uh, suggesting that corticosteroid can have a deleterious effect on SARS. Uh, so WHO was very reluctant to provide any recommendation uh, for the use, recommending the use of corticosteroid, and that, that, that looks logical. So what was very important here, as in all the drugs that we've been discussing about, is, is how to manage uncertainty. And the best way to manage uncertainty is doing a study. So I think that including our patient in studies is the best way to, to go forward. So it, did they do, do wrong? Uh, imagine that the, the discovery trial would have a negative result. Then, then who knows? We would have been exposing a lot of patients to a deleterious treatment. So we have to be careful about that. Okay, um, available evidence is available evidence and can change. And the yeah. other thing is, um, would you've not, you haven't talked about cluster randomized trials and the protocol of the institution is something that it, uh, it had its good things and its bad things. Do you think about random, uh, cluster randomized trials in the setting of pandemic? Well, it's been, it has been discussed. Uh, the problem here is that uh, if you if you doing a cluster randomized trial uh, for a, a specific therapeutical decision, uh, you you will have a lot of problems to address about uh, many confounding factors. Uh, it, it may be the case that it, within a city or a specific region, uh, patient different hospital can be very similar that it, it may not be the same if you're comparing patients in different regions, even within the same country, because if you don't have, I mean, one of the experiences in the first wave was that there was areas in which this healthcare system was blocked. So the type of patient being admitted may be different to areas where the healthcare system is not suffering that much and you are admitting, let's say, milder patient, et cetera. So I think that in that situation, it would be better to go for individual randomized trials. Last question, because we're going, um, we're not ahead of time, is uh, what do you think is from the audience too? Uh, how do you think non-large hospitals, small hospitals could participate in randomized clinical trials? How, how can these hospitals be involved in the circuit? Well, I think it is a very good question. I think that uh, during this prepar preparedness uh, phase, uh, what, what is very important is that anyone who is able to, to participate in a trial is, is known and is prepared to do that. Uh, participating in a trial involves some complexity. Uh, being trained about that is, is important. Having some resources is important. But if the trial is uh, uh, pragmatic enough, that would facilit that facilitate uh, uh, the, the procedures very much. So what I would suggest to all hospitals wanting to participate is contacting the uh, people leading some of the trials and, and offering them to participate. But I think that from the preparedness point of view, we need to uh, open the possibilities for all these hospitals to participate, set up some criteria for participation and put the hospital to work to achieve those criteria. Okay, thank you very much, Jesus, again. And Bruno, we can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much too for this uh, excellent speech. So now we'll move to the third uh, 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 lecture. Uh, it, is, it will be done by Jose Arribas. 
uh, Jose is the head of the Infectious Disease Unit uh, and the Research Director of HIV Infectious Disease at La Paz Hospital and Associate Professor of Medicine at uh, Autumna University School of Medicine, Madrid, in Spain. Uh, he will talk about mild, moderate and severe COVID-19. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. These are my financial disclosures. And the other disclosure that I have to make is uh, because of the sake, on sake of time, I'm not going to talk about oxygen therapy, antibiotic therapy, anticoagulation in this, uh, present, in this presentation. So let's go to the first case. Uh, is Mr. Ares comes to the ER. He's a 35-year-old male from Ecuador has been living in Spain for the, for the last uh, 15 years, lives in Madrid with six other people in a small house, and just five days ago, it started with fever, malaise, and cough, no dyspnea. Past medical history is nothing significant. His temperature is 37.8, normal blood pressure, 22 respirations per minute. Saturation is 96% uh, on ambient air. So uh, an esophageal swab for, uh, is positive for SARS-CoV-2. So if we look at the uh, WHO and guidelines and the clinical management of COVID, uh, this patient uh, can be classified uh, as mild disease because it's a symptomatic patient meeting the case definition without evidence of viral pneumonia or hypoxia. Um, uh, if we go to the NIH guidelines, um, it will feed mild illness because of various symptoms, has fever, cough, uh, but no soreness of breath, dyspnea, or abnormal imaging. And um, so that's my first question for you is, is the poll. Do you need in this patient that is, uh, has a saturation of 96% on ambient air, do you feel you need a chest x-ray to make your clinical decisions in these patients? You can both. So can we see the results, William? So there is completely divided. So I'm gonna put on the spot Jose Ramon Paño. So what will you think, Jose Ramon? You are mute. Okay. I would I would do the chest X-ray because I know that his condition can change and I want to know if it changes or not. Okay. Uh, Jesus, another opinion, or is the audience was so divided? It's tw 22 respiratories per minute, which is kind of uh, tachypnea, so I would do. I will do. Okay, completely normal chest X-ray. Okay, so uh, next is I have you need labs on this patient now. No, I'm, I'm think that you can be working us in the ER, but you can be also a primary care physician. You think to make your decision lapse on this patient or not? So can we have the results? Let's try to be quick. So 59% lapse, 41% uh, no lapse. Bruno, you want to say something? You need lapse in this mild case with normal success rate to make decision. Would the labs, any of the labs uh, that you get will change how you manage this patient? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I would ask for additional lab tests, uh, especially ABG. ABG. Oh, you are not happy, it's, it's not this near, has saturation 96%. You will ask for ABG. Any other opinion? Yeah, I think, in my opinion, I, I, I think I, I will not need the labs to make a decision in this patient. 
Uh, currently, with our situation, I think this patient will be uh, uh, thought as a very mild, mild pneumonia will send home. But other opinions in the panel? No, since, since this patient is five days of symptoms, meaning that we are in the viral phase and there's no pneumonia, so I, I think that we can observe the uh, Our practice would be to observe the patient. Okay, so uh, he was sent uh, without labs to a medical aside hotel. Remember, he lives with six other people in a small home. Uh, would you prescribe antipyretics, paracetamol, acet acetaminophen, um, non-steroidals, or doesn't matter? You can vote now. William, can we have the results? Uh, well, the, doesn't matter, but the majority acetaminophen, uh, we can go to the we can go to the WHO uh, recommendation uh, that is recommended for patients with mild COVID to be given symptomatic treatment such as diuretics. And there is a remark that at present there is no evidence to indicate that non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs makes things worse. But it's very important, even with this patient that it has a mild disease that uh, WHO recognizes that patients have to be instructed that if they worsen, especially if they develop shortness of breath, they have to return to a designated COVID area if they get worse. So that's a, probably the most important message for my cases that things can deteriorate. Let's complicate a little bit this same case. Now, instead of young, he's a 65 year old. He's also from Ecuador, has been living in Spain for 15 years. His um, housing is better, lives only with her wife and is able to isolate at home. Uh, he's also in five days of symptoms, but past medical history is remarkable for hypertension, type two diabetes and he's obese. And has exactly the same uh, physical exam than the other one, his saturation is 96%. Nasopharyngeal swab is positive for SARS-CoV-2. Chest X-ray is ground glass opacity, left lower lobe, um, and has a lymphopenia, has a glucose of 123, transaminases are normal, and PCR is 30. So uh, we know from very good cohorts, this massive open safely uh, initiative in the UK that uh, this patient has a high risk of deterioration, has older age, 65, male gender, obesity, and diabetes. Although at present, the patient is not needing oxygen. So in the clinical um, um, evolution of COVID-19, he's here on day five, is at the beginning of the, of the disease, but we know that uh, a substantial number of patients from this point of can deteriorate. So the cr criteria to make this patient in the hospital is a difficult decision because we have an, a lack of oral treatment with proven efficacy. And also because early initiation of treatment is a reasonable concept, but the problem we have is the only antiviral that we have with some evidence of activity is IV, that is remdesivir. And also we don't know even in these patients who's going to deteriorate even at younger age and the deterioration can happen very quickly. And also we have to take into account if we send the patient home, if, if home isolation is possible. Or also uh, bed availability in the hospital. When we were in March in, and in April, the availability of beds make an important impact in our decisions. So what will you do with this patient that you have the labs, the x-ray, will you send him home? Will you send, will you admit it to your hospital? Uh, will you send home with telemedicine follow-up or you will enroll in a clinical trial, this patient? So can we have the results, William? So 50% hospital, 28% home with telemedicine, 16% clinical trial. Jose Ramon, what are you doing with these patients in your hospitals right now? 
Uh, well, I was going to say thank you for the last option of the poll, uh, because for me it was relieving. Uh, but in my hospital, I think that currently this patient will be admitted. We don't have the infrastructure for a very tight home control and um, doesn't look very good how, how he's going. So I'm not, uh, Jesus, any other opinion? What are you doing with this? Uh, we will admit the patient and include a randomized trial, both. Okay. So we don't have a trial for this profile for one. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> yes, we have. Plus, convalescent plasma. Okay, so we enroll this patient in the trial that just Jesus denigrated. <laughs> we enroll this patient in the Rendesivir uh, versus the standard of care clinical trial uh, that uh, included moderate COVID pneumonia. And this patient was had a saturation about 94% and had pulmonary infiltrates. And I've, I've been an, um, an author on this paper, you know, and this is, uh, has this very um, difficult to interpret result. You see there that on the left panel, five days of Rendesivir were better than standard of care and 10 days were not better. This was an open label trial and it, you have to keep patients for 10 days. And we use, I think, an endpoint that I think I have a hard time thinking that we are going to continue to use this time, um, this endpoint. If you mix the design of the trial that some patients have to take five, some patients have to take 10 and have to stay to the hospital in the hospital to receive the 10 days, but we are looking at recovery is really a very difficult trial to, um, to uh, interpret. And I agree completely, and I agree completely with the uh, added to the conclusions that the difference was of uncertain clinical importance. Uh, so we still don't know. We include this patient in the trial, but still we don't know. But imagine that you have a very good telemedicine program and you can send a patient home with a pulse oximeter. Uh, he comes back uh, because uh, the people who call him to, the hospital, to the patient at home um, get the information that day, on day seven, patient complains of soreness of breath at rest. Uh, he's transferred to the ER. So now we are here on day seven, we're starting in the part of the, of the disease that might uh, um, make things very worse. So on day seven, things are, are worse. He had deteriorated, his respiratory rate is 33, saturation is 92%, success rate is, is worsen, has worsened, has bilateral ground glass opacity is more than 50%, lymphopenia is worse, Neutrophilia is high, glucose is 188, transaminases are high, PCR is higher, ferritin is higher, creatinine clearance is, is uh, appropriate for his age, D dimer is higher, and troponin is normal. So we have severe disease here, according to the NIH, a saturation of less than 94%, more than 30 respiratory uh, respirations per minute, and have um, you know, lung infiltrates that uh, affect more than 50% of the lung. At this meeting, we are presented um, um, a score that we have developed in Spain uh, through our Infectious Diseases Society cohort. And this patient, uh, is, is this um, a score is quite, a, it's only for hospitalized patients, for patients who come to the ER. It's very simple, only take into account age, uh, low age adjusted saturation, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, EGFR, dyspnea, and six, and six, sorry. If you add the, uh, all the points that he has, has nine points, and you can see here in the bottom of the slide that the 30-day uh, mortality is extremely high, both in the derivation cohort and in the validation cohort. So we are talking here about severe disease. Question very simple. Will you give this patient remdesivir if you have it available or not? You can vote now. Can we have the results? So 76% voted in favor of, of remdesivir. Um, are you in agreement? Uh, many of you, you want to make a comment? 
I guess I, you will. I, sorry, sorry. Go. No, no, please, Jesus. No, no, I guess that you will be asking more drugs or or liver intensivir, Jose. I will be asking more, of course. Okay. Well, I will I will uh, try to guess remdesivir as compassionate use in Spain now, but uh, my my confidence in its efficacy will be very very low. I will do other things. Other things. Um, Ramon, what do you think of the elevated liver test? Um, is I mean, is it no, um, is viral transaminitis, or like what do you think of the liver? I think this is because of COVID, and I think it's not not quite five times in my hospital. As you know, uh, that you cannot start remdesivir according to the label if you have five. But I think sometimes this is a, a vicious circle because what is causing the uh, hepatitis is, is SARS-CoV-2. But we don't have experience, a lot of experience with remdesivir in that type of situation and we don't know if the toxicity will be worse uh, if you have I, I, I've used it in three patients with over five times the limit and the trans, the liver function test went dropped very quickly so uh, that was good and do you think that there are any other signs that the virus is more doing a more uh, uh, direct effect on the picture we are seeing, because there is a quite overlapping between the viral phase, the symptoms of the viral phase, and the symptoms of the inflammatory phase. Right. And is there a clue that you have? I CPK, uh, CPK, liver function test, low uh, platelets. Um, I really don't know. Monophasic course of the disease uh, with right. a no, non improvement. I don't know. It's just yes, this patient got worse, has tr higher transaminases. I will, I will think that it, this is the virus, but um, I think it's not terrible plan, but I don't know how to answer that question. So this is the uh, current landscape. This is a nice CCO slide that uh, what um, treatments that we have de in depend uh, depending on the different phases of the disease. Uh, we have here remdesivir. And as we mentioned, we don't have a clear answer. It's, it's very early on, it's better to start of care because the relevance of the clinical findings in the study um, is not, um, is, is not completely certain, but we have better data in patients with more severe disease. And we have also dexamethasone that we will go back there on oxygen. So um, IDSA recommends remdesivir in patients with hos hospitalized severe COVID-19. Um, NIH also recommends remdesivir. Uh, in general, I, I'm not going to get into the details, but there is not a lot of data supporting that 10 days is better than five. In the comparative clinical trials, five days were the same than 10 days, but some experts in patients uh, we still, uh, there are data that patients who go to the intensive care unit, they have uh, replicative viruses for a long period. So in, if, if theoretically you have an antiviral, you will be able to use it. And the WHO also recommends remdesivir rather than non-remdesivir in patients with severe COVID. Although uh, they acknowledge, and I'm going to get into the details of the analysis that um, as Jesus was saying, uh, the evidence is, the quality of the evidence is low. Um, what we have in the best trials so far is that an, in, an improvement in time to clinical improvement. That the best trial that we have is the ACT-1 trial, that is a double-blind trial that compared remdesivir uh, for 10 days versus placebo. And it, it was really something that we have to congratulate the investigators because running a double blind trial in that circumstances in the States was not very difficult. And we see here time to recovery um, uh, was better in general for remdesivir than placebo. But the subgroup analysis saw that the most benefit, and it's also because it was the largest sample size, was in patients re receiving oxygen and patients receiving high flow oxygen or non-invasive mechanical ventilation, or they were receiving mechanical ventilation or ECMO, it was not uh, evident at all that remdesivir was adding any beneficial effect. Also, it's uh, going back to Jesus' question and 
this was interesting that in subgroup analysis, they could not find an, an advantage of starting remdesivir uh, with less than 10 days of symptoms than with more than 10 days of symptoms. And for us, as infectious disease doctors, that's always surprised us that the sooner we start, perhaps no, nobody you know, started almost on second day or third day. You look at the median, uh, I think uh, the majority of patients started five or six days after starting of symptoms. So the FDA label, uh, um, well, first of all, uh, tell that there might be um, uh, adverse events that still we don't know, that we have to monitor chemistries um, and transaminases, and also that we sh um, don't sh should not administer uh, remdesivir if baseline uh, transaminases are higher than five times the upper limit of normal. Uh, and also recommend to discontinue if the transaminases are high. Uh, the European label is very similar. It's indicated for um, patients with corona COVID-19 um, that five or 10 days of, of therapy, and it should not be used in patients with a GFR of less than 30 milliliters per minute. Okay, so uh, I think uh, Jesus was anticipating this. Uh, in this patient, the next question is if you would uh, give him uh, steroids, yes or no? You can vote now. Can we have the votes? Well, here it seems like the message um, came across 97%. Still, there is one dissident that um, didn't, wouldn't use steroids in this patient. So, with steroids, I highly recommend the WHO um, living guidance document. Um, they have um, this very visual, attractive. Uh, graph, um, they have two recommendations, one for non-severe and one for severe and critical. Uh, I have highlighted that the WHO considers severe with less than 90% of, of Brunner, but I recommend you to um, look at the details of the, of the document. They recognize that um, the threshold of 90% to define severe COVID was arbitrary and there are patients in whom uh, uh, saturation between 90 and 94 uh, might be abnormal if clinicians suspect that this number is an abnormal mm. trend. So don't focus specifically on 90%. Uh, here is the way that um, they support the recommendation. They support with a strong opinion corticosteroids for patients with severe and critical COVID and there you have the impact on mortality that is, 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 is quite important. Uh, for, but it's also important to remember because uh, we are seeing it in the hospital that patients, for patients with non-severe COVID, um, the, um, in the, the steroids can be even it's a trend that it can be even detrimental. So steroids is for uh, severe uh, disease, not for uh, mo uh, moderate disease. And this is the meta-analysis that they just published comparing three different types of steroids, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, and methylprednisone. And here, this is a very important endpoint. It's all cause mortality at 28 days. And the biggest experience is with dexamethasone in the recovery trial. But the overall trends with steroids for patients uh, on 28 uh, day uh, mortality favors the use of steroids. Uh, when they do subgroup analysis, um, they found a benefit in patients uh, on invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, not in patients taking vasoactive medication, uh, regardless of age was effective, regardless of gender. And it's important because this is different in the meta-analysis, giving them less than seven days of symptoms of more than seven days of symptoms, they found a benefit of starting corticosteroids. But this is by no means the end of the all, all of what we're going to learn about steroids, optimal dose, optimal uh, duration. Still, there is no evidence suggesting that a higher dose of corticosteroids was associated 
with a greater benefit than a lower dose of corticosteroids. Remember that in the recovery trial, and it was kind of surprising, in the recovery trial, in the subgroup analysis, patients who started um, with uh, more than seven days of disease were the ones who got the benefit of the semestazone. Uh, what the WHO has to say about that is that they have a long discussion but the panel concluded that given the evidence, it was preferable to err on the side of administering corticosteroids when treating patients with severe or critical COVID, even if with, within seven days of symptoms onset, than err to the side of uh, not giving corticosteroids when treating patients with non severe disease. So don't forget that we are giving an immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, uh, patients can have diabetes, some patients can have strongyloides, uh, you, we have to uh, think about all these co-infections that can reactivate with steroids. What else we have? Well, so far we have remdesivir and we have corticosteroids. Uh, it's the best data that we have. Next question will be in this patient, um, is in some way, forget about the previous questions, at some point Will you consider to give tocilizumab, yes or no? And I understand that it's a very complicated question. Okay, can we have the result? So 75% no, 25% yes. Um, I'm going to... Um, Yes, before I ask the panel, I'm going to show you. So this is uh, the results of the preprint mm -hmm. of the tocilizumab trial, the COVACTA trial. Uh, the COVACTA trial didn't show a benefit of tocilizumab in the primary endpoint. Um, but we have retrospective data, and this is another study that we have performed with the uh, risk cohort and the Infectious Diseases Society of Spain. The first author is one of our panelists, Jesus Rodriguez Baño. And in this um, retrospective study that um, restricted the analysis to patients who have oxygen requirements or, um, and also have um, some biomarker of inflammation, we did find a uh, benefit of tocilizumab um, in this cohort. So to tosi or not to tosi, that's the question. Um, the reaction uh, to these findings of the Covacta preprint results is that the timing was probably wrong, that Covacta eligibility, eligibility criteria were broad and did not appear to stratify patients by clinical signs of hyperinflammation. Uh, we are waiting for the results of Impacta beyond the press release that also with tocilizumab, less mechanical ventilation, no impact on mortality. And we are waiting for recovery. And I have to call here Jesus that is, um, has looked at, at a lot of the, uh, uh, at this issue of tocilizumab. What's the role, uh, how we make sense of these apparently controversial results between clinical trials and cohorts? Well, we will have to see if, if the uh, type of patients included in PACTA or subgroups in recovery will provide information about the specific subgroup that we are discussing. So I don't think that the COVACTA provides uh, uh, information for this specific patient that we're discussing. So my, my point in this specific patient is that I will wait for the effect of the dexamethasone if the patients uh, uh, do not improve and get worse uh, and the paramet inflammatory parameters get higher, then we need to do something. There is no evidence what to do in those patients so far. Uh, so I think in that patient, it can be considered. The ideal situation would be to include a patient in a randomized trial for that specific situation. If you cannot do that, the options are high dose corticosteroids, uh, tocilizumab or other similar drugs, but, but we have no evidence. Uh, according to the observational data that you showed, I think that uh, you can consider tocilizumab if the patient gets worse and getting higher inflammation parameters. So, Jose Ramon, which is the best moment to, to give tocilizumab, in your opinion, in the, in the evolution of disease? I think that the concept of cytokine storm has been misleading. It has a good cell from the behavioral approach, 
uh, because it drives the need to do something. But I've seen a high rocketing IL-6 going down with six milligrams of dexamethasone and remdesivir. So uh, as tocilizumab has a long-term effect, a long-term long life, I, I, I concur with Jesus that I would wait how the patient would respond with low-dose dexamethasone and remdesivir before launching uh, the long-lived uh, tocilizumab. So, so um, I wouldn't... Yeah. Why is why do you think, uh, for any of the panelists, why do you think for tocilizumab is so important the timing and for steroids it does, it, it is not? Or because not of the steroid trials, they, they request for hyperinflammation biomarkers. Well, I think that corticosteroids have a wide range of effects uh, that are not only uh, related to hyperinflammation there. So I think that uh, probably these wider effects types of corticosteroid should be providing some benefits in, in different types of patients. Why tocilizumab is a very specific drug. It, it blocks uh, IL-6 receptors. So if you don't have an effect, direct or indirect effect of IL-6, you, you would not expect it to have any benefit. So uh, I think that probably we need to have high level of having IL-6 or uh, some markers suggesting that it's working. So, so, but that will, you know, the other theory will be that focusing on just one interleukin is pro perhaps is not, is not, um, uh, could be not success successful that, because as you said, tocilizumab is very specific. And when I, talk to uh, tocilizumab believers, uh, they say there is a very specific point in time that is when the viral response phase is going away and when the host inflammatory response is starting to build up. And But it's difficult it, to know if your patient is exactly at this point. So I'm gonna end up my, with a joke, uh, my, you know, the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg says that you cannot measure the position and the momentum of a particle with absolute precision. The more accurately we know one of these values, the less accurately we know the other. That's why the sign is you are probably here. So I'm going to say that in COVID, uh, the uncertainty principle says that we cannot measure the inflammation and the viral loads of COVID-19 patients with absolute precision. And I'm going to finish with uh, this, I think, this landscape of what we have so far, uh, Brendesevir and dexamethasone. This is by no means that we have um, uh, all that we need, because if you look even with dexamethasone and Brendesevir, many people are dying of COVID-19. So we are going to have to wait for more trials. So thank you very much for your attention. If there are more questions, Happy. Jesus, Jose, what do you think of colchicine? Because there are two small clinical trials, but the small, despite they are very small, both have shown some significant, statistically significant and clinically relevant results. Small, but two independent. Right. Well, um, I don't know very well the, the studies, Jose Ramon, in which it was for mild disease or? It was in a moderate to severe disease, non-intubated patient. One is a Greek trial. The other one is a Brazilian trial, less than 100 patients. And in the Greek trial, the likelihood of a death or mechanical ventilation was significantly lower than in the standard of care. And in the other one, the number of days on oxygen therapy and in hospital stay were shorter in the colchicine than in the standard of care. So they are very small trials, but both are statistically significant with clinically relevant outcomes. So, so uh, do you have any experience? No, not personal experience. Where are we going now? You know, in I think both in operation warp speed and also these huge trials that are going to test pharmacological measures and also in the European initiatives um, when the, you know, the people who know more about this get to pick and what was going to be the next iteration of pharmacological therapy, 
I see monoclonal antibodies coming, but I don't. I have not heard about a big trial trying colchicine. I, I, I'm not seeing it. So, but you know, I'm not saying that a bigger, but probably a bigger trial will be needed. Thank you very much, Jose. Bruno, let's move forward. Yes, okay. Okay, uh, our, our next and last speaker is Bruno Megarbane. He is an intensive care doctor in Hospital La Riboisier in Paris. And uh, he is going to talk us about the treatment the, of critically ill patient. He perhaps is not going to go very deep on these pharmacological issues on antivirals and immunomodulators, but he's going to give us uh, an insight on the support is, uh, supportive uh, measures and also how to prevent complications. And I think uh, probably this is the most important part of therapy nowadays, for certain, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, to save lives, uh, you have to support patients. And please, Bruno, uh, we will be- Thank, thank you for your uh, very kind introduction. I'm sharing my screen. Is it okay? Good. Okay, perfect. So we'll talk about the critically ill COVID-19 patients. Uh, so as uh, we discussed already, uh, this uh, epidemic now, has now spread uh, worldwide and there are an important percentage of severe cases around 15%. Uh, among them, 5% will require admission to the intensive care unit. Unfortunately, among these patients, some of them will die. And initially, uh, uh, the rate of this was estimated to be about 50% in the critical cases. Uh, uh, COVID-19 patients with acute respiratory failure have probably overwhelmed critical care capacity in many cities and countries. So we'll go through a case report and we'll discuss the various uh, 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 therapy uh, in the ICU. So this is a 40, uh, uh, 56 year old male. Uh, he suffered from hypertension and diabetes. Uh, he was treated with uh, atenolol, erbesartan, met metmorphine and uh, alprazolam. He is relatively obese and he developed fever with uh, progressive polypnea, general uh, fatigue since three days before admission to the emergency department. When he was referred to the uh, emergency room, he was perfectly conscious uh, with a uh, Glasgow Coma score of 15. His temperature was 39.5 degree. His blood pressure 136, uh, 97 millimeter of mercury. Heart rate 118 per minute. Respiratory rate 24 per minute and SpO2 89%. His pulmonary auscultation showed mild cracklings. And of course, he was detected positive for SARS-CoV-2. He rapidly uh, was put under oxygen eight liter per minute using high concentration mask. While waiting in the emergency department uh, uh, for his lab tests, he experienced uh, a progressive worsening during this immediate five hour observation period with an increase in his respiratory rate till 32 per minute and a requirement of increased oxygen flow to 15 liter per minute. Here you, you see his first ABG, uh, pH 7.43, uh, PACO2 31 millimeter of mercury, PAO2 56 millimeter of mercury under oxygen 15 liter per minute. Uh, bicarbonate 22 millimol per liter and lactate, uh, serum lactate 2.2 millimol per liter. And you see also his 
chest X-ray. So my first question, how do you manage this acute respiratory insufficiency? Uh, do you use high flow nasal cannula, continuous positive airway pressure, non-invasive ventilation? Do you go to immediate tracheal intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation? or just you monitor the patient without any new intervention in the emergency department. Yes, that's right. Probably uh, the best way at that uh, uh, stage is to use high flow nasal cannula as you we will discuss uh, in the beginning of the epidemics we would have immediately uh, intubated the patient but now this is not anymore the recommended strategy of course CPAP and non-invasive uh, ventilation are possible alternatives Hopla. So let's, uh, sorry, I don't know why it's not, it's not going. Oh. So uh, uh, let's uh, uh, talk about the general principles of treating uh, uh, RDS in uh, COVID-19 patients with mechanical ventilation. Of course, it's very important uh, in case of worsening to support uh, ventilation with lung protective uh, ventilation, that is the only way to improve the final outcome. So uh, uh, ventilation uh, will include uh, 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 targeting, will target low uh, tidal volume and limiting plateau pressure to 30 centimeter of water with optimized PEP and recruiting maneuvers. Of course, if required, the patient will uh, require sedation and analgesia uh, to uh, uh, allow uh, 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 and to promote his comfort uh, and ventilator synchrony. Uh, he may uh, receive neuromuscular blockade if these synchronies uh, appear that may limit the application of lung protective ventilation or result in life-threatening issues uh, with gas exchange. Uh, the duration of neuromuscular blockade is still uh, not uh, determined, but should uh, be relatively brief. Of course, rapidly you will have to use a conservative strategy for fluid administration, uh, including if required an aggressive diuresis uh, to uh, maintain, uh, 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 to, con to preserve uh, oxygenation uh, and uh, when required, prone positioning of the patient will be necessary, especially if the ratio PaO2 and FeO2 will decrease less than 150, unless of course contraindications like severe hemodynamic instability and in the most severe cases, you may go to VV ECMO. So this is the program of the strategy to manage RDS in these patients. The patient, in fact, will go through two important stages. And now these two COVID-19 RDS phenotypes have been uh, clearly identified. You see first, the first type is called the type L with low lung elastance, high compliance, lower lung weight as estimated uh, by CT scan, low response to uh, positive uh, uh, end pressure, uh, and uh, uh, low lung recreability. So in these patients, you, were be, you will be able to use uh, high flow nasal cannula, CPAP and non-invasive ventilation to avoid immediate a tracheal ventilation just by increasing FeO2. And if uh, uh, intubation is required, you will be able to use higher uh, volume, uh, tidal volume 
and uh, reduce PEP since the patient is relatively responsive. Uh, if the uh, uh, in uh, when the patients will uh, 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 progress in the disease, you will go to uh, type H RDS phenotype, and here you see you have a relatively low compliance with high elastance, a higher lung weight as estimated by the CT scan shown on the, on the slide, with extensive CT uh, consolidations. Uh, the patients will require high PEP with good response to the PEP, uh, uh, and his lung will be highly recruitable. So in these patients, who will be generally intubated, you will use limited tidal volumes, high PIP, uh, if compatible with hemodynamics, and rapidly you will go to prone positionings. And if uh, the strategy failed, you may use ECMO. There were several questions to know if there are differences between COVID and non-COVID-19 related RDS. And this interesting study shows you that probably uh, there are the, the, both situations are similar. And you see that uh, in COVID-19 patients, compared to non-COVID-19 patients, there was no difference in oxygenation response to ventilation, no difference in uh, response to PEP level, no difference in response to prone positioning, and even there was no difference regarding mortality rate. In fact, the compliance uh, of the respiratory system and the total lung weight seems to be similar, and when you look at the uh, outcome of these patients, probably those patients who will have the worst outcome are those who will present a low compliance and a high DDMR levels. But otherwise, RDS in COVID-19 seems to have the same evolution and outcome than non-COVID-19 RDS. More recently, of course, as we discussed, concerns about the, uh, uh, appeared about the rapid intubation that was used initially because intensivists were afraid of the risk of infection uh, uh, and uh, uh, used immediate uh, intubation. Uh, now, uh, intubation has been delayed. Uh, new practices around awake proning of non-intubated patients have been developed to treat respiratory failure and to improve gas exchange. And patients are encouraged, even in the medical ward, to maintain themselves in the prone position for prolonged periods of time, so that now the optimal timing for intubation appears uncertain and debated. Uh, probably we now use the same timing of intubation than we usually use in non-COVID-19 patients. Bruno. So my second question Bruno. now is Bruno. in this patient who yeah. developed fever, acute respiratory distress in the emergency department, which anti-infective drugs will you prescribe? the association of cefotaxim plus spiramycin, uh, piperacillin tazobactam, the association of amoxicillin plus jantamycin, the association of cefotaxim plus voriconazole, or no antibiotic at all. <laughs> this is a good question. So it seems that the majority of you are stronger believer that uh, 
all the features are only related to uh, uh, coronavirus and no risk of uh, co-infection with bacteria uh, could be observed. So let's move uh, to uh, this slide. In the most severe patients, it appears that early bacterial co-infection could be documented in at least 25% of the patients. The three most important species accounting for more than 90% or of all identified bacteria are Staphylococcus aureus, Haemophilus influenzae, and, staphyl and, and Staphylococcus pneumoniae. Co-infection with multiple bacterial species are relatively rare. So my recommendation would be to rapidly administrate a first-line beta-lactam antibiotic in this patient. Uh, till uh, uh, having more uh, uh, bacteria results supporting that there is or not a co-infection. Because this patient seems to, uh, the situation of this patient seemed to uh, worsen relatively rapidly. And as you see, according to this study, there was no significant difference in the outcome according to the presence or not of co-infection when the patient was admitted. So my opinion would have been to administer to the patient cefotaxim plus pyramicin rapidly as soon as he is admitted to the intensive care unit in a probabilistic way till waiting for additional bacterial uh, test results. Would you administer any immunomodulatory uh, uh, drug uh, to this patient? So you have the choice between uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, tocilizumab, dexamethasone. Yes, I think all of you have really well followed the previous presentations. You're right, here the response is clearly uh, dexamethasone. Oh, sorry. So hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir, ritonavir has proven ineffective even in the most severe RDS patients. Remdesivir in the group of severe uh, uh, COVID-19 patients is probably with uncertain utility and there is still need for additional evidence. And due also to potential adverse effects, I would not prescribe this drug. Uh, IL-6 uh, blockade has no evidence of beneficial effect based on the different RCTs that were presented. And you should know that plasma IL-6 IL uh, level in COVID-19 patients are orders of magnitude lower than in patients with cytokine release syndrome, and even lower than in patients with RDS not associated with COVID-19. So the major drug, immunomodulatory drug that is now uh, indicated in these severe COVID-19 patients is uh, corticosteroids, including dexamethasone. Uh, it has uh, proved survival benefit even at early stage with oxygen requirement, but of course, more importantly, in mechanically ventilated patients. The effect, size, and clarity of the results in COVID-19 patients uh, uh, surprisingly con contrasts with the equivocal findings of prior trials in RDS, in which till now decades of research have led still to conflicting results and no consensus. Uh, you, sh you saw previously these slides from uh, the WHO REACT working group with the meta-analysis and you see clearly that overall uh, benefit has been demonstrated for the administration of corticosteroid 
to reduce all cause mortality at 28 de uh, day. So to date, WHO guidelines recommend strictly the administration of corticosteroids in the most severe cases. Uh, this slide shows you that even when uh, investigating and analyzing the different uh, uh, subgroup based on the patient characteristics at the time of randomization, there is also almost constantly a benefit on survival. And you see that in the invasive, mechanically ventilated patient, there is clearly a benefit to rapidly administer uh, dexamethasone. Probably the patients that have the less evident benefit is those uh, requiring vasoactive medications for possibly a bacterial sepsis with uh, 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 septic shock and uh, the patients who are symptomatic of less than seven days as previ previously discussed. Uh, side effects are also uh, uh, limited. Uh, and you, you see here that uh, the overall benefit is in favor, seems in favor of uh, the administration of the drugs. So I would of course administer dexamethasone rapidly in the patient as soon as he's admitted to the intensive care unit, unless we have clear evidence to support that he has a bacterial uh, septic shock requiring vasoactive drugs. So the patient was uh, treated with high flow nasal cannula with an FeO2 about 70% and a flow of 40 liter per minute. He received dexamethasone, cefotaxim, spiramycin and enoxoparib. On day two, he uh, complains about rapidly increasing dyspnea. His vital signs uh, were the following, blood pressure 180 millimeter of mercury, heart rate 132 per minute, respiratory rate 35 per minute, SpO2 85%. There was no uh, significant modification when uh, Ausculting his lungs. So, what is your suspicion? Hospital acquired bacterial infection, invasive aspergillosis, pulmonary embolism, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, or only worsening COVID 19 infection? Yes, probably you're right. Of course, uh, this is the probably the first diagnosis to suggest in these patients who uh, suddenly uh, have a worsening in his respiratory situation with an increase in his respiratory rate and a decrease in his uh, uh, saturation and worsening ABGs. You should know that uh, uh, the prevalence of uh, 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 deep vein thrombosis among uh, uh, COVID-19 patients uh, in the ICU is important. Uh, in our ICU, we published a, a prevalence of 50, among about 50% of the patient with systematic uh, Doppler uh, of the lower limbs. Uh, this rate was even higher in some publication, up to 85% of the patients. So you have, of course, to be uh, uh, aware about the risk of thromboembolic event. And as you suspected, the pulmonary embolism incidence is also elevated as shown on this slide. Uh, and with this systematic review 
of the different publications and probably uh, this event accounted for more than 15 percent of the deaths uh, and in especially the rapid deaths in these more severe patients in the ICU, at least at the beginning of the epidemics. Why, we would say why there are such uh, a risk. So we uh, analyzed in our uh, ICU patients uh, uh, the uh, different uh, coagulation factors we were able to demonstrate uh, the presence of an imbalance between uh, the uh, sorry between the procoagulant factors and the natural coagulation inhibitors that may contribute to this situation of hypercoagulability of course all of us know that these patients have relatively elevated dedimer uh, uh, in uh, the plasma but you see that there is a strikingly elevation in factor 8, in von Wilbrandt factor, and a relatively uh, decrease in uh, the activity of protein C and protein S in these patients. This, this uh, slide shows you uh, this uh, uh, the, the existence of uh, some discrepancy between the chromogenic protein C and the clotting-based protein C activities among the patients. Uh, among those who presented or did not present a uh, thromboembolic uh, uh, event, showing that this is a characteristic of COVID-19 patients. Of course, uh, the dedimer is probably the most accurate uh, marker to identify such a risk of thromboembolic event. And you know, and we found a value, a threshold value of 3,300 uh, nanogram per milliliter as a sensitive and specific biomarker to suspect the risk of uh, thromboembolic event in case of uh, Doppler is uh, not uh, 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 possible to perform at the bedside of these patients. So why these patients are at risk of uh, 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 thromboembolic events? Because of course, as explained, they have an hypercoagulability in their blood. They have also uh, um, an impairment in their endothelial cells with uh, a direct uh, coronavirus effects on the endothelial cells. And of course, there is in the majority of these patients who are admitted to the intensive care unit, mechanically ventilated, receiving elevated PEP uh, with immobility in the bed, a decrease in venous blood velocity. So these constitute the triad of Virchow that increase the risk of uh, thromboembolic uh, events, uh, explaining why the prevalence uh, is elevated in these patients. So that, of course, uh, the majority of us has started uh, to uh, uh, look at the possible advantage of in enhancing the anticoagulation in these patients. And we uh, 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 submitted this uh, work, uh, this pre preliminary work, comparing two periods uh, of management in our ICU. The first one with uh, normal uh, 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 preventive anticoagulation in uh, 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 the normal prophylaxis uh, in our patient, and the second with an increased anticoagulation uh, in the patients. And you see, we were able to demonstrate a reduction in the risk of proximal deep vein thrombosis, while as expected, there was some increase in the risk of uh, uh, hemorrhage, although 
the most important uh, uh, bleeding events were observed only in ECMO treated patients. So this preliminary work is uh, now submitted to publication. The second uh, risk of complication in those patients is uh, the onset of ventilator associated respiratory tract infections. You see in this uh, European multicenter cohort study, it was demonstrated that SARS-CoV-2 uh, infected patients has an increased risk of uh, 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 ventilator associated uh, pulmonary infection in comparison to influenza and non-viral infected patient. And as expected also, the onset of such VAP in these patients is associated with a worsening in their outcome, as it was observed in influenza patients. Finally, the third risk in the patient is the onset of early pulmonary aspergillosis, like in flu uh, patients. We also published criteria for the diagnosis of this uh, 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 complication, because of course, these patients are not completely uh, like those who are neutropenic, but there are some impairment in their uh, 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 immunological uh, defense. They have underlying host factors like lymphopenia, they may be treated with uh, medications that can alter autophagy uh, properties like hydroxychloroquine. There is uh, an impairment in the calicrine kinin system that is useful uh, to defend against uh, uh, fungus. And they have, of course, several defecti defective uh, and alterations in uh, their defense system like uh, uh, reactive, uh, reactive oxygen, um, uh, that, like, sorry, uh, an impairment and in their production of reactive oxygen species, uh, response of their T helper cells, uh, and of course, uh, various different uh, uh, immunological abnormalities. So it was important to uh, uh, define some criteria for the diagnosis of putative invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. And we recommend in at least those invasively mechanically ventilated in the ICU to weekly look at and search for uh, uh, aspergillosis infection by uh, uh, looking for this criteria and the diagnosis could be suggested in if first uh, aspergillo aspergillus is identified in uh, bronchoalveolar liquid culture or in the presence of two of the following conditions presence of uh, aspergillus in bronchial aspiration culture positive PCR in any of the uh, 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 respiratory uh, specimens, the presence of galactomannan index of more than 0 0.8 in uh, bronchoalveolar uh, liquid, lavage, galactomannan index of more than 0 0.5 in serum, and beta deglucan more than 80 picogram per, per, per ml in serum. So with these criteria, if uh, validated in a patient, we could uh, suggest to uh, introduce an anti-aspergillosis therapy. Although to date, of course, there is no demonstration that such a preemptive treatment is uh, useful or not. Bruno, we have to we have run out so of time. No. Let's move. The patient is now intubated, mechanically ventilated with the protective ventilation we discussed. Despite muscle paralysis, 
and prone positioning, his respiratory situation continued to worsen. While his hemodynamic stability appears to be relatively preserved, his ABG are now the following pH 7.23, POCO2 69 millimeter of mercury, PO2 on FeO2 ratio 65, lactate 7 millimol per liter. So, which management do you suggest? Introduction of almitrine infusion, uh, introduction of nitrous gas, implementation of RTU venous ECMO, implementation of venovenous ECMO, or no additional intervention, just monitoring in the ICU. Bruno, we, we ran out of time, so we have to... Uh, ah, sorry, uh, just two minutes, I, I will go quickly. So, you're right, it's an ECMO, but we have to go to uh, VV ECMO. Just to tell you that Almitrin is probably unuseful, and as you see on this slide, VV ECMO has showed its benefit, and you see that in this uh, retrospective cohort study from France, almost 60% of the patients who were treated with VV ECMO in very severe uh, situations uh, 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 survived. So my final slide is about out outcomes of critical care patients. You see here that uh, uh, probably the outcomes of COVID-19 RDS patients should be the same or should be similar for non-COVID-19 RDS patients and probably much more better than initially feared. Recent studies reported outcomes with a hospital mortality of 30%, but now probably the uh, mortality rate will be lower. Of course, uh, 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 there are still some wariness about long-term sequela uh, following ICU uh, hospitalization, and those should still be studied, including recovery differences uh, from other uh, forms of severe critical illnesses. And of course, uh, we ha have to still investigate the extent of functional and psychological consequences of this ICU stay in these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno, uh, for your excellent speech. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have not time now for further questions. Uh, some of them have been answered uh, by Jesus on the chat. And thank you very much all for your attention. Uh, Dr. Rivas had to leave, but uh, that uh, thank you all for your attention and for the uh, to Jesus, Bruno, and Jose Ramon for uh, for your excellent talks. Bye.